Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are welcoming Dr. Son O. Ryan for his talk on promoting Irish language, current challenges and opportunities under Ireland-India Friendship Lecture Series. Dr. Ryan is an Irish diplomat and linguist at present in charge of promotion of multilingualism at, at the Irish Foreign Ministry. He has had almost 42 years of diplomatic service, which includes his tenure in Brussels with the EU, Germany, Poland, Australia, and twice in Austria. He has been Irish charged the affairs twice in Austria and Poland. From 2007 to 2015, he was posted as an expert with the European Commission in Brussels, setting up the Irish language selection, a section, a section of the web transfer, translation unit. He has a PhD from Trinity College Dublin for his thesis on language planning in Ireland and Quebec 1919 to 1985. His MA thesis in University of Galway dealt with the evolution of verbal aspects from old to modern Irish. He was a lecturer in modern Irish at the University of Maynooth, Ireland for two years. His academic interests include equitable international communication, improved language learning, particularly for weaker students, and Celtic language and their revival. Dr. Son, has many publications to his credit, which include Lisbon Explained in 2009, the EU and Irish language, identity and linguistic diversity, a strategic examination of the formulation and implementation of Irish language policy 1994, and many others. Dr. Son is a fluent speaker of Irish, English, French, German, Polish, Spanish, uh. Esperanto, Welsh, and can read Italian and Portuguese, Dutch, Russian, and Scottish dialect. He has done some studies on Hebrew and Britain too. Uh, before I request Dr. Son, of, Son to begin his lecture, I request His Excellency Ambassador to present his thoughts on the question. Namaskar. Uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to express my uh, profound gratitude to Dr. Son uh, for most kindly and generously accepting our invitation. We are truly honored to have, sir, uh, such a distinguished diplomat, scholar, and above all, a, a wonderful human being. You have been so inspiring, so kind to us since we uh, came in contact. We are truly humbled to have uh, an erudite linguist like you in our program. Um, uh, this year, as you know, we are celebrating 75 years of India's independence. Uh, so as a new ambassador to Ireland, I'm in the process of uh, retrospecting about our past, and I cannot but feel very grateful to Ireland, the people of Ireland, who have been uh, such a great source of inspiration to people in India. Uh, despite being small in size, Ireland has been ahead of us in many ways. Uh, Ireland's freedom struggle against a very powerful colonial force, uh, it was a source of inspiration to us, uh, our Irish people's uh, tech techniques uh, and tactics and strategies, how to fight for independence, uh, political and peaceful means, and also some disparate and not so peaceful measures. All of them were studied very carefully in India and uh, they inspired similar uh, movements back home in India. Uh, also the concepts like home rule movement and uh, social and political and spiritual awakening at the grassroots level, uh, ideas which came from Ireland to India, played a very significant role. Also, when we were drafting our constitution, then we counted on a very generous support and very practical sharing of our experiences from the Irish leadership and also the Irish uh, legal experts. Also, Ireland was ahead of India in launching its socioeconomic uh, reforms and uh, Ireland's a magnificent uh, transformation uh, through socio-economic technological innovation has been a matter of great joy for me to study and be inspired by. Uh, the idea of uh, uh, India Ireland Friendship Lecture Series, series uh, is essentially to revive that same old spirit of solidarity and sharing of uh, each other's uh, wisdom, each other's uh, experience, a uh, spirit of mutual learning and caring. Uh, without uh, any sense of judgment, uh, but uh, with utmost respect for each other's uniqueness and individuality as uh, two great uh, countries. 
uh, among issues that I think of uh, India and dialogue and, and, and conversation, language uh, stands out as a, one of uh, the most important themes for us to have consultation and dialogue and uh, engage in mutual learning and sharing of strategies. Uh, Ireland uh, in some ways has similarities with India and also uh, but uh, has many differences like uh, Ireland uh, like India has two major languages uh, at the official central level uh, but India has no national language. We have 22 uh, scheduled languages recognized in our constitution. We have about 1400 mother, mother tongues spoken in India. There are 32 languages spoken by more than 1 million people and 121 languages uh, which are spoken by more than 10,000 uh, Indians. Uh, so India's linguistic scenario is very complex, extremely diverse. Uh, but issues are common. And that is why I was very keen to have a consultation with someone who is very knowledgeable, Dr. Hussain. Uh, language, as we all know, is not just a mechanical instrument for communication, not just compilation of words or set of rules that govern their uh, usage, but it is something alive, something living. It is to me the life bre breath uh, of, uh, a national body politic, body. Uh, and it's, it's, language is not just a means like gaining information such as eyes and ears uh, and visual aids or hearing aids, but it is to me the nervous system of the body itself. It gives us the consciousness of self, uh, language gives us the consciousness of our environment, our surrounding. Also language gives us that inheritance of custom, tradition, history, uh, and knowledge that our ancestors have passed on through a generation after a generation. If language is lost, our connection with the past is lost. Our history is lost, our heritage is lost. Uh, that is why it is extremely important for us to care for our native languages. In Sanskrit, there is a saying, Mulam yatnato rakshaniyam chinne mule naivavriksho na shakha. If the root is cut off, then you cannot have uh, branches or tree uh, or flowers or fruits. The whole tree gets uh, damaged. That is why it is critical to uh, nurture the root uh, of the tree. Uh, and also I wish to share my, my view that uh, we, we have a crisis uh, in, in our native languages, not because they are inferior, nor because they have some inherent weakness or lack of resilience. Uh, in fact, our native languages have survived so many challenges uh, and so many natural processes over several thousands of years. The crisis before native languages came about because of external fa factors, because of external forces who indulged in very systematic destruction of the native cultures and also native languages through multiple instruments uh, at their disposal. And today the, the most powerful instruments of market and the mass media and also the technology, the, all of them are uh, biased against native languages. And that is why uh, 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 friends in Ireland and uh, experts in India need to consult. How do we cope with this challenge? Uh, Ireland, I'm very happy that has been ahead of India in terms of very far-sighted visionary leadership. Uh, our Irish language has, uh, thanks to the efforts of the government and the people of Ireland, has become the official language of the European Union. And also I see growing uh, respect and usage of Irish in the mass media, in art and cultural creativity. Uh, so there's a lot that gives us joy, it gives us a lot of optimism that uh, if our land can do it, probably we can also do it in some manner. And that is why I'm extremely grateful to Dr. Sen, who has been an insider in reviving and preserving and promoting Irish language uh, to join us in this program and share his wisdom, share his thought. And uh, I'm sure that your presentation would be uh, very keenly observed in uh, India in different parts. Thank you so much. We are truly honored. Thank you, sir.
Uh, I now request uh, Dr. Sonu Ryan uh, for his lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador uh, Achilles Misha. Uh, I, I must say I agree with, with everything you have said as regards languages, and, and, and uh, I would also like to, to thank you for the invitation to speak here today and uh, to congratulate India on the 75th uh, anniversary of independence. Uh, as you say, Ireland and India have, have much in common, even though we have large differences as well, but we can inspire each other, and it is uh, marvelous to be part of the um, cooperation between Ireland and India, and uh, particularly in, in the area of, of language. Uh, I would like to begin with a couple of um, anecdotes uh, to lighten the atmosphere. Uh, also, uh, before I do this, uh, I would like to, I'm delighted that um, Dr. Padre Line, who was the, the driving force towards uh, gaining uh, official European Union status to the Irish language back in 2004, 2005, um, is uh, with us today, and, and uh, I had uh, the honor of launching his, his most recent book here in Brussels uh, a few weeks ago. But I begin with a couple of um, um, little anecdotes just to, to lighten the atmosphere. Um, my second daughter, Kira, who is now 26 years old, was born uh, in Poland when I worked at the Irish Embassy in Warsaw. And uh, when she was just three and a half, the family moved back to Ireland and she was sent to an, an Irish speaking school. After her first day in school, I asked her, uh, well, Kira, the, we always spoke Irish together. I asked her if she liked uh, how she liked her first day of new school. Oh, she said, I don't like it at all. Um, why? Horrible people, she said. She said, horrible people. They all pretend they don't understand Polish. Kira was, was, of course, born in Poland and a country of 40 million people where everybody speaks Polish. And she just couldn't understand that she was now in a new country where people really didn't understand Polish. So this is a surprise, a surprise to her. A second little anecdote, which I heard from an English professor, um, Robert Philipson, who's a, a very eminent professor in the whole area of language policy. Uh, he's written books such as Linguistic Imperialism and, and uh, English Only Europe, and has um, 20 years working experience with the British Council, but he has done uh, marvelous work uh, to, to heighten, to increase awareness of the importance of, of uh, ling linguistic diversity. And um, he told me a little anecdote many years ago, which I, I only have the courage to, to repeat because I heard it from an English professor. And this was that um, an, uh, an Englishman visited Ireland for the first time and came across a young Irishman who was um, very diligently studying the Irish language. And the Englishman was puzzled and he said, uh, uh, is that not just a waste of time? This, this language is, has no, the Irish language has no international use. It's not even spoken by all parts of Ireland. So you're not just wasting your time. Well, why do you study this language? The Irishman answered, well, uh, Irish was the language of all of my ancestors for, for thousands, ancestors for thousands of years. And when I die and go to heaven, I want to be able to speak to them. The Englishman said, Interesting, yes, but uh, if you lead a bad life and you, you wind up not going to, to heaven, but, but going to hell, um, how will you solve this problem? And the Irish said, absolutely no problem. I already speak English. So moving on to um, our topic today, when Irish became uh, an official language of the European Union on the 1st of January 2007, it had a literary tradition of 1,410 years. I'll repeat that because it's not so well known. 1,410 years. That is over eight years, 80 years longer than English and over 20, almost 250 years longer than French or German. The first literary text in Irish, the Avra Cholmkille, the Laman for St. Cholmkille, dates from 597 AD. I have a version of it here. Um, in four languages, the original Old Irish uh, and translations into modern Irish, English, and Scottish Gaelic. Irish, um, though it's viewed as a minor language today and is spoken by very small numbers of people, cannot be compared to, to Hindi, which is spoken by hundreds of millions of people and one of the major languages of the, of the world. 
Um, Irish was not always a, a minor language by any means uh, historically. For instance, Pro Professor Brian O'Creeve wrote that uh, in 1840, just before the famine, I, over 5 million people were either native speakers of Irish or the, the children of native speakers of Irish. And uh, about 20 years ago, a Belgian professor, uh, Jean-Claude Pollet of the uh, Université Catholique de Louvain, produced uh, a 17 volume Patrimoine littéraire européen, in other words, uh, selections from the history of Europe from the beginning until the present day and from the uh, Ural Mountains to the Atlantic, all of, all of Europe. And almost 5% of the material in this book and this, in, in this series of books um, is material translated from Irish. So it's by no means a minor language. The, so in order to come to um, a better understanding of our present situation of the Irish language, I would like to quickly go through um, some, some history. And I will try not to, to detain you for too long on the, on the history. It's something I can speak for in too much detail sometimes, so I will try, I will try to go through it as quickly as possible. Irish was the, the language of Ireland for thousands of years and the place and, and most of Scotland, the place names of all of the island of Ireland and of most of Scotland show that this language is called Scottish Gaelic in, in Scotland and Irish in, in Ireland or Gaelga in the language itself uh, was the original language and is the language which uh, explains most place names and most family names in the country in, in throughout Ireland and indeed for much of Scotland as well. In 1169, we had the Anglo-Norman invasion, uh, which was the first dint in the armor of Irish. This uh, led some centuries later to the Statutes of Kilkenny. In 1366, we had the first laws against the use of the Irish language were passed. So in the 14th century, possibly among the earliest language laws anywhere in the world. But it is important to stress that the Statutes of Kilkenny against the Irish language were not aimed at the Irish themselves. They were aimed at the English colony in Ireland, which had taken Irish wives and was becoming more and more Irish in language and was becoming assimilated to the Irish speaking population. Um, these laws, as I mentioned, were passed in 1366, but they were in the early centuries, they were very ineffective because in 1541, when King Henry, Henry VIII of England decided he would change his title. He had been Lord of Ireland. He decided to appoint himself King of Ireland. And uh, the Royal Proclamation in 1541 was sent from London to Dublin and read out in English to the colonial parliament in Dublin. But the majority of those present couldn't understand it. So it had to be translated into Irish so that the majority of the English parliament in Ireland could understand that they now had a new king, Henry VIII. The language remained dominant for very many centuries, even after this. And the first real change took place in the 19th century with the, the Great Irish Famine, 1845 to 1841. Uh, the Irish population had been increasing very rapidly and uh, it passed 8.2 million in 1841, the 1841 census, and continued to increase until the famine hit in 1845. So it probably passed 9 million at a time when the population of Great Britain of the neighboring island was 18 million. So one third of the population of the two islands uh, lived in Ireland uh, at the time. The famine hit in 1845 due to the failure of the potato crop. Most of the Irish had been living from potatoes uh, to a poor country. It was really exploited by our colonial masters. and. Um, because of the failure of the potato crop in three years in a row, 1845, 46, 47, somewhere between one and two million Irish, pe Irish people died of hunger, about a quarter of the population at the time. And um, the language went into rapid decline because all of those who died of hunger were native speakers of Irish. In fact, many of them came to blame the, the language itself but the fact that they were poor and the fact that they were dying of hunger whereas the English speakers in the east of the country were much more wealthy and were not dying of hunger. 
not to the same extent, you had something like one percent in the east the coast of Ireland and eighty percent in, in Mayo, in the, the west coast of Ireland. So uh, this led um, during the second half of the nineteenth century, the decline of Irish was extremely rapid. Uh, Sean the train says this was sixteen times more rapid than the decline of Scottish Gaelic in Scotland. So that by the end of the nineteenth century, we were approaching the, the disappearance of the language. In the 1891 census, only 3% of children spoke Irish at home. One year later, 1892, Douglas Hyde, who uh, was of Protestant of English descent, but who later became president, the first president of Ireland, he delivered a famous lecture called The, the Necessity for De-Anglicising Ireland. This was de 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 delivered in November 1892. This led a a little less than a year later, in July 1893, to the foundation of a new movement, the Irish language movement, called the Gaelic League, or in Irish, Conan O'Gaelga. Initially, it was a small movement, but it spread throughout the country and became a really mass movement. In, on the 19th of September 1909, the, this movement, the language movement, assembled over 100,000 people in the streets of Dublin not just to, to demand the teaching of Irish, but to demand, but to demand that a qualification of Irish be an essential, be essential to study at the new National University of Ireland. This was opposed initially by the university, but because of popular support, the university relented, and from 1913, they made, they agreed that Irish, the Irish language, Irish language qualification, would be essential to study. At any of the colleges of the National University of Ireland in, in Dublin, Cork, or Galway. So this became essential from 18, 1913. And it led immediately to the a vast increase in the number of schools teaching Irish, the number of primary schools teaching Irish, within the space of a few years, went from 20% to close to 100%. And this, I stress, this happened uh, nine years before independence, nine years before the withdrawal of British troops in 1922 and the setting up of the, the free Irish Free State. So the um, Irish in the schools was not something imposed by the Irish government or the Irish state. It was a, a bottom-up movement, something imposed by the people themselves um, on a very unwilling colonial authority at the time in, in, in Ireland. I could mention in, in, in passing that um, there was a large campaign at the time about the teaching of Irish in schools. The Trinity College at the time, which was the only university in Ireland, was very much against the teaching of Irish. Um, the provost of Trinity College, a guy called Mahathy, who he didn't know any Irish himself, but he was uh, sure, he said by his professor of Irish, that uh, learning Irish was a waste of time. In fact, he went further. He was, Atkinson was a, an Englishman who learned Old Irish, the old the, the literary language of the, the eighth, seventh and eighth century, but he never learned modern, modern Irish. But um, he opposed, strongly opposed the teaching of Irish in schools. And it's very hard to imagine a, a professor of Irish, a university professor of Irish, opposing the teaching of Irish to Irish children. But he actually went as far as saying that it was Irish literature in Irish was, was worthless. And uh, everything written in Irish, he said, was either pious are indecent. And he would never allow one of his seven daughters to learn how to read Irish. But because uh, Atkinson was so strong in uh, opposing the teaching of Irish, the language movement decided to take action. And the Douglas Hyde, president of the language movement, wrote to many universities across Europe and received replies from universities in Germany, France, Spain, Italy, all of them unanimously saying, that Irish children should study the Irish language. So Trinity College was on its own, was the, the only one against the study of Irish in Irish schools. And uh, the Irish language movement went one step further then. They began to examine the texts, the academic texts published by Professor Atkinson. And they found quite a number of mistakes. Uh, the Irish language is complex in one area. It has two verbs to be, is and ta, one for temporary qualities and one for permanent qualities. And they discovered that uh, Professor Atkinson never had a profound understanding of the, the difference between the, uh, the two verbs to be in Irish. 
And this led to um, humorous, humorous verses among children in the streets of Dublin. One of them was, um, as you know, Trinity, Trinity College. Can can you still hear me? I, I, everything went got cut off. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, we, we can hear you. You can hear me. Yeah, sorry, everything just switched off oh, for no, a moment. Sure. So I continue. Yeah, sure. uh, as you know, Trinity College is known, uh, often called Trinity College Dublin, is called TCD. And there was a rhyme among the children of the streets of Dublin at the time saying, Atkinson of TCD does not know the verb to be. <laughs> Moving on uh, in history to um, Michael Collins, who was the um, mastermind of the guerrilla warfare, which uh, led to Irish independence a little over a century ago. Michael Collins, um, he was impressed by the fact that 69% of those involved in the national movement uh, the movement uh, for Irish independence came into the national movement through the language movement. And uh, I would like to quote uh, something written by Michael Collins because he he was very prophetic in his, his vision. And uh, I think even though he died in the Irish Civil War in 1922, uh, very tragically, what he wrote back in 1920 is still, to my mind, very relevant today. Michael Collins wrote as follows. Are we all ed yet educated to be free? Have not the greatest number of us still the speech of the foreigner on our tongues? Are not even we who are proudly call ourselves Gaels little more than imitation Englishmen? But we are free to remedy these things. We are free now to get back and to keep all that was taken from us. The survival of some connection with our former enemy, since it has no power to chain us, should act as a useful irritant. It should act, it should be a continual reminder of how near we came to being indeed a British nation. No one now has any power to make us that but ourselves alone. The biggest task will be the restoration of the language. How can we express our most subtle thoughts and finest feelings in a foreign tongue. Irish will scarcely be our language in this generation, not even perhaps in the next, but until we have it again on our tongues and in our minds, we are not free. Prophetic words indeed, because Collins could see that changing the language of the country was not something that could be done overnight and he recognized that the language will scarcely be a language in this generation and not even perhaps in the next well it's still not a majority language a hundred years later but it hasn't died out either um moving on to the constitution of we had two constitutions in ireland as, uh, as, as the ambassador Michel mentioned the um 37 constitution was inspirational for the, the uh, first constitution in india but the, both the Constitution of 1922, the Irish Free State Constitution, and the 1937 Constitution, the Constitution which is in, in force at present, both of them recognized Irish and Irish alone as the national language. They recognized both Irish and English as official languages, but Irish alone as the national language. The uh, 1937 Constitution went even one step further and uh, called Irish the, the first official language or in Irish which means principal official language. And English was called a second official language. Or in Irish, it was called which means another official language. And uh, Article 25 of the Constitution was very clear. It said in the case of uh, differences between the Irish and English texts of the Constitution, the text in the national language shall prevail. Apparently, it was alone among ex-British Commonwealth countries 
in giving a higher status to the native language than the former colonial language. So even though English is very much the majority language throughout the island of Ireland today, in the constitution, it has to take place second, at second place to the Irish language, the national language of Ireland. The um, legislation has been brought in, uh, the first legislation to be brought in to um, specifically dealing with Irish was in 2003, just 19 years ago, the Official Languages Act. And this was strengthened by an, uh, the amended Official Languages Act in the end of 2021, the end of last year. Now, um, just two, two points. First of all, to the 1920s, um, it was, became essential to uh, have a knowledge of Irish in the public service. Uh, this, was when this, this was again removed in the 1970s. Uh, and uh, something came uh, along which uh, was very extremely useful in retaining the language in the Irish speaking areas, the, the grant of, it was called the Deontus. It was a small uh, monetary amount of, it was originally two pounds uh, per child. For native speaking childs in grant of areas, uh, there were inspectors sent around the, the country who would interview the children uh, at three years of age. And if they could be certified as being native speakers of Irish, then the family would be paid which originally two pounds two pounds per child per year. But in large grants of families, maybe 10 children, this came to quite an amount. And it was gradually increased over the years until it was abolished finally in 2011. But um, it was a very useful monetary incentive to keep the language alive at a time when it could really have disappeared. So as I mentioned, the two Languages Act 2003 and 2021 uh, are aimed at strengthening the, the Irish language. And the, the 2021 Act considerably strengthens the 2003 Act. One of the important uh, provisions of the 2021 legislation is uh, the aim of 20% uh, of public service recruits being fluent Irish speakers by 2030. Uh, there has also been legislative action outside of um, Ireland. The United Kingdom government in Westminster introduced uh, a few weeks ago, introduced uh, legislation um, for Irish in Northern Ireland and, and also Scots. Um, the Irish Language Act in 2003 established the office of the Commissioner Tanga, or the Irish Language Commissioner, an office set up to, to supervise the implementation of the legislation and uh, the British Act which is uh, now before the British Parliament, is to set up uh, a similar uh, commissioner in, in Northern Ireland, one dealing with Irish and one dealing with Ulster Scots. Um, it, this was part of the St Andrews Agreement of 2006, but because of opposition uh, within Northern Ireland, this promise was never fulfilled. So the British government has decided to go ahead and, and uh, uh, give the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland the power to appoint the commissioners for the two languages in Northern Ireland. There has, was a lot of uh, symbolic use of Irish over the years. That, for instance, uh, when the first Irish parliament met on the 21st of January 1919, uh, only Irish was spoken, which meant that the 10% who were fluent in Irish did all the speaking, and the 90% who didn't speak Irish voluntarily agreed to remain silent on the first day of that parliament. The Declaration of Independence was read on this day. It was read in three languages, first in Irish, secondly in French, and only third in English. And from the beginning of the foundation of the state until the common EU passport in 1985, all Irish diplomatic passports were just in two languages, in Irish and in French. They had no English on them. These were just symbolic gestures, but they were aimed at, at, at uh, stressing the fact that now Ireland wanted to be a separate nation from England. It was not hostility to England or hostility to England. It was the, 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 the fact that Ireland was now rotating on its own axis, so to speak. It was no longer saw itself as a colony, as, a, as, a, as an English province. However, um, for probably the first 40 years of the state, uh, there was a, a gradual increase in the use of Irish for official purposes. But from 
as a, an excellent book, which has just been published by Dr. Padre Gorlain, Pablo McGregor points out, uh, this is the, the uh, book on the Irish language uh, community, uh, points out that from the 1960s on, there was a marginalization of the use of Irish. There was um, the then Taoiseach, or Prime Minister, uh, Sean Lamas, was never uh, very enthusiastic about the language. And the um, Secretary of the Department of Finance, T.K. Whitaker, who himself was an Irish speaker, had a somewhat say, a flawed understanding of the importance of Irish. He understood the importance of Irish as a heritage language, as a language of um, song and, and, and literature, but not as a language for official governmental work. And in this case, this led to a flawed understanding within the public service and a gradual decrease in the amount of Irish. So over the following years, you had a marginalization of Irish. Uh, and um, in the last 20 years, again, as uh, Padre Gualain points out in his uh, excellent book, which I would strongly recommend uh, reading, he's working on an English version of it. Uh, the book at the moment, of course, is only in Irish, but uh, it will eventually be published in an English version. Um, there has been a growth of Irish language schools over the past 40 years, uh, up to, they were down at about 2% of the total uh, in 1975. They now have grown to about 10% of the total of national schools in the Republic, but they're, they're growing also in Northern Ireland. So there are Irish language schools, a Gaelic school in, a, in all parts of the, the in all, every county of the, the island. Um, um, the aim of um, Dr. Lyons' book, indeed, could be summed up as to bring, um, to give de facto status to the language uh, in the same way as it already has the euro status. In other words, to make it de facto the national language as well as the, the declared national language in the constitution. Uh, this this uh, has always been a weakness and this is the, the crux of the matter. Uh, state policy over the years uh, had, were, had concentrated on the improved teaching of Irish, improved learning of Irish. A huge amount was done over the years to improve the teaching of Irish. But it was never understood that there was also a need to create opportunities to use the language. There was no understanding of this, that the, the use of the language does not increase automatically. You need to create institutions, you need to create um, opportunities to uh, create, uh, to institutionalize or to normalize the use of the language. As um, Dr. Lyons' book points out, um, and I think a key point of the book is uh, the need to create Irish speaking sections in all government departments, initially with three to five public servants working in them, which would work through Irish, so that Irish would become a, a part of, of the administration of Ireland. This is nothing against the use of English. It wouldn't in any way interfere with, with it wouldn't uh, declare, it wouldn't interfere with the use of English, it wouldn't in interfere with the, the rights of English because they're working in English. It, the aim is to create a space, a public space for the use of the Irish language beside English, so that a country which has two official languages could be seen to have two, uh, two languages actually in use, as well as simply, simply mentioned in, um, in the Constitution. Uh, I think this is, uh, is very important. This, um, uh, again, Dr. Alain is uh, an expert on, in Quebec and the, the language legislation in, in French and in Canada and particularly in, in Quebec. But um, a former Minister for Culture in Quebec, uh, Camille Laurent, quoted uh, a French writer, uh, Henri Lacordaire, um, who said, Entre le fort et le faible, c'est la liberté qui opprime et la loi qui affranchit. In other words, when you're dealing with the, the strong and the weak, it is liberty, it is freedom which oppresses, and it is the law which frees, which gives freedom. In other words, I, I like to draw the analogy of a, of a zoo. You can imagine in a zoo with the lion arguing for freedom for all animals, open all the cages and set all the animals free. This would be freedom for the lion to kill and eat the other animals. In the same way, the strong speaks against legislation and says the law, just leave everybody free, it'll work out fine. But what actually happens in that situation is that the, the dominant language pushes all the others aside. 
I, I can see you see this again and again. The, the Eurovision Song Contest, for instance, for many years, each country was obliged to sing in its own language. And in those days, I would watch the Eurovision Song Contest because it was a really, it was a genuinely international contest. You heard songs in all the different languages. But this rule was relaxed, relaxed in the 1990s, and people were allowed to sing in English. But what happened was you got a dominance of English. You got more and more countries singing in English and ignoring their own languages. I, for one, stopped, stopped watching it, as I said, because for me, it, had, it was no longer an international conference center. It, was, it had become a, a provincial English-speaking song contest, which was of little interest to me, I have to, to admit. But to stress that the aim is not restricting the use of English or the rights of English because of what creating a public space for Irish. Uh, the colonized mind, to a large extent, is still very dominant in Ireland. i just give, to give two examples of this in, in, in passing. In 2015, for instance, the, uh, in March every year, the Irish Parliament, Doyle Erin, has an Irish language day, a day in which all members are, are encouraged to, to speak in Irish if possible and speak only in Irish if, if, if they can. Uh, much more Irish is used in this day than any other day of the year. But the, um, in 2015, the then Taoiseach, uh, Prime Minister, and the Kenny, who was a fluent Irish speaker, and in fact a teacher of Irish, um, spoke in Irish, decided he would speak only in Irish that day. He was asked a question by a deputy about foreign policy. The question was in English, and he replied in Irish. The deputy objected right away and said, sorry, I don't understand Irish. And the teacher said, uh, just put on your earphones. There is a interpretation service in the parliament. Anybody who doesn't understand Irish only has to put on a pair of earphones and they hear an English version of what has been said. But the deputy, for reasons best known to himself, refused to put on the earphones and tried to insist that the teacher should, should speak in English. And the teacher said, no, he said, there's only one day a year in which we speak in Irish. And I, as an Irish speaker, will not be speaking in English today. He said, if you want to understand me, you put on the earphones, and I will continue to speak in Irish. This led to even international headlines. The, the Economist had a headline, Irish Prime Minister refuses to speak English at the time. But it was an incident. Indeed, I was surprised that the, the English language media in Ireland were very strongly condemnatory of the Taoiseach, saying that he was arrogant in, 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 in insisting in speaking Irish when it was clear that a deputy didn't understand Irish, but that they didn't understand that um, it was the one day of the year that people were asked to speak Irish, and the deputy concerned only had to put on earphones if he wanted to understand. There was no, no problem in understanding. Um, this is one incident in, in passing. Another incident was three years later in 2018, the then president of the um, European Commission, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, former Prime Minister of Luxembourg, visited Ireland and uh, addressed a joint session of the Doyle and Shannon, the, the two houses, Irish Houses of Parliament. And uh, afterwards, there was a question time by members of the, the Doyle. And one of the members, Catherine Connolly, asked the question in Irish. Uh, Juncker, being a a multilingual and being very used to the use of different languages, immediately put on his earphones, heard the, the, the interpretation into English, and uh, replied to the question. It created no problem in the slightest in this situation. However, many of the deputy's colleagues in the Doyle and parts of the media were very critical of this particular deputy, saying if she was bad mannered to use Irish. They completely missed the point. Juncker was the president of the European Commission. The European Commission was spending a lot of money in recruiting translators, translating legislation into Irish. So that he would have expected, in visiting the Irish Parliament, he would have expected to hear both languages. So in fact, the only deputy who did the right thing on, on that occasion was the deputy who used Irish and showed that it was a living language. All of the others who, who, uh, went out, who didn't use Irish were, uh, in fact, showing the Juncker that uh, he was wasting his, his money, that there was need, no need uh, for the use of Irish. So it was uh, very much a rep reprehensive act, but we're 
happily, there was one deputy who understood the situation. Um, I, would fi I would finish with um, a paraphrase of Scottish poet uh, Hugh McDiarmid, because he said that um, he can, sometimes poetry can say more than, than prose. And uh, I just like to quote two lines of his poetry, which I, went to, I took the liberty of translating into Irish. Uh, he wrote, um, but I have faith in Scotland's hidden powers. The present is theirs, but all the past and future is ours. Which comes out in Irish as, Ach credimse e gochti kelsen a halvan, is lua will, ach is lina a meach is a meg. Thank you for your attention. If there are any questions or, or comments, I'd be glad to, to, to reply. Do you see any questions? Oh, no, sir. I'm just looking at it. Nobody has. No, I am, I'm not seeing any questions here. Uh, I, I see that the line. If, if I could make an observation. Oh, that'd be very kind. Great, great to see you, sir. No, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, I, sh I should say that uh, I've known Sean for a number of years and I have never during that time spoken with him in English. <laughs> so uh, um, I, I, I would like to, uh, to congratulate Sean for, for his lecture and, um, and, and some of the fascinating examples that he gave at the end and um, also for his, his, his very concise um, um, representation of, of my positions in the book. Um, this, I suppose uh, some an issue that, that refers to Ireland and also to, to India, I would think that uh, if you have dominant languages in the institutions of the state, mm. um, it's always possible Complementarity of languages mm -hmm. is very important. One, one can reintroduce mm -hmm. um, languages into the institutions of the state mm -hmm. without displacing the dominant languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, this complementarity of languages, rather than excluding the dominant language, mm -hmm. I think is an important yes. approach. Mm -hmm. But I, I very much enjoyed the comprehensiveness of Sean's lecture and was delighted to be present. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. As, as you say, it's the first time we've ever used English to, to each other. <laughs> <laughs> it, feels, it feels very strange indeed. Uh, one little point I forgot to mention in passing was um, when I was in Poland, I, I served for five and a half years at the embassy in, in Warsaw. and. Um, I met a lot of Polish people who uh, assumed that Irish must be some kind of dialect of English. They assumed that, uh, well, because they could speak English, they learned English, they would understand Irish. So I had a custom of, uh, I would put my hand in my pocket and take out a, a million zloty notes. Now, a million zlotys, uh, there were old zlotys in Poland at the time. A million zlotys was about 25 euros. It's not a huge amount of money. But I would hold up this note of one million zlotys and I would say, I will now recite a poem in Irish. And if anybody here can understand one single word of the poem, I will give them the money. I will give them the, the, the millions of worthies. In the five and a half years I spent in Poland, I never had to give that money to, to anybody because I never, and just the poem I used to re recite, um, I might just recite it now because it's, it's short and it's about St. Patrick, uh, I but I think it emphasizes the difference between Irish and English and the fact that Irish, that English is in fact much closer to French than it is to Irish, mm -hmm. uh, linguistically. But the little poem goes, Keshtig Padrig Gran Ngail, La Ar Lechem Bria Ilt, Quiltemach Ronan Neskel, Tra in Eden, Irlash. Inish doing a scaly din, Kreva Gudivsha and Timus, the Kreva Finishib, Kanza, and Edad Bair in the Firma. Three trehe the Gang Nation, Ragar Quilt the Kilver, Planya Agri, but Nyarta Nyag is part 
Mahu. Very good. I, I meant to, to, to mention that earlier on, but in, in, in passing, I don't like reading speeches. I, I did uh, a written version of the talk, but I, I just uh, wrote some little notes myself then, and uh, this often happens that I leave out something, uh, but I'm glad, glad that I have the, uh, the opportunity to add it later on. But it was uh, on one other occasion in Poland, the Polish National Radio asked me along uh, to, to speak for one moment, just one minute in Irish and Polish National Radio. And then they had a phone-in competition as if you could phone in and win a prize by just guessing which language it was. There was something like over 70 people phoned and they guessed from Norwegian to Icelandic to German to Hebrew to Arabic, everything, but nobody guessed Irish. So again, we, 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 we had a prize which was never given out because nobody succeeded in guessing which, which language it was. Thank you, Dr. Son, for bringing out the history and importance of Irish language. In fact, having once one language, native language, is critical of a country, country's identity, its culture, its heritage, its people, it binds, binds everybody. So thank you. Thank you for bringing out so nicely, uh, Dr. Son, and also Dr. Lyon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you much. Ambassador. Thank so, you so much. Thank you so much. It was a great experience to learn, uh, to hear two most eminent scholars uh, and uh, your, your passion, your, uh, your inspiring work uh, has been uh, very impressive. Uh, and we need, we need. Yeah, I, I think we will need to have further conversation, maybe privately, on a lot of interesting ideas that have uh, been uh, generated uh, uh, out of a lecture by Dr. San, uh, especially how, uh, in terms of practical uh, steps, uh, the idea of uh, uh, creating more incentives and more opportunities for use of native languages. So I think this is one, again, interesting uh, area for India and Ireland to share experiences. Absolutely. Incentivize. Absolutely. I agree completely. And I, I, I'm always available. I'd be delighted to, and I'm sure Prodig is too, we're delighted to, to continue this, this cooperation. And, and, yes. Uh, then you're very kind. Uh, very very, very, very kind. kind. Thank, Thank you so much. The, the, we are very grateful. Really grateful. And uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure uh, dealing, dealing with you. As I uh, say, we're, we're in contact by email and we, 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 we continue our. Our cooperation. It's, it's a Thank you so much. Great Most kind. To with, with Most kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank we will end the session now. Thank you very much.